No matter what we've been through, we can say it as well. No matter what we have to look forward to, look through the fire like it says in there, and we might not have the answers, we might not know the way, but God always does. Hey, and even if he doesn't come up and provide that way for us for some reason, we can say it is well. Hey, Matt. With my soul. Hey, Matt. I think about the author that wrote that, Roger Spafford, that wrote that song, It Is Well With My Soul. And when he wrote it, he wrote it because he uh, ran for the Great Chicago Fire. He got a, they decided they were going to go on vacation. They were going to go over to, to England. And he put his wife and daughters on one of the big old flagships and sent them across. A few days later, uh, he got a telegram to say the long. The ship went down. The storm was just his wife and his state, their daughters, they perished in the sea. And they took him up. When they, he got a boat, he was on his way over. Finally, uh, they took him about midnight that night and said, uh, Brothers, this is where we think your, your wife, the, the Villa de Aubrey, sank. And he looked at it and stayed so as well with my soul. To have that kind of faith in God. We need to be able to look at everything in our lives and say, it is well with my soul. Amen. I uh, kind of changed the title of the message this morning. Uh, at one point this week, I called it, is he preaching at me? But I put it down to uh, drop the stones when I kept reading over the text. I like that. Drop the stone. Um, I was an avid rock thrower. I was pretty accurate, and uh, I love to throw rocks. Uh, asked my neighbor buddy that I hit in the head a couple times with him. But uh, uh, hey, he made me mad. He hit me. He was bigger than me. He went run the way, so I threw a rock at him. Even the head. So, but uh, drop the stones. John eight. And it's uh, 1 to 11. I'm going to read the text here, and then we'll get into uh, the message. Um, got my Bible opened up to it, but I also have it printed out on here, and it's a lot bigger than what it is in my Bible, so I'm going to read it from there. Uh, Jesus went into the Mount of Olives, and early in the morning he came again into the temple, and all the people came unto him, and he sat down and taught them. And the scribes and the Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery, and when they had had set her in the midst, they said, Master, this woman was, ta was, was, in, was taken in adultery in the very act. I don't know where the man was. But Master, this, man was, this uh, woman was taken in the very act of adultery, was taken in adultery in the very act. Verse 5, Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what sayest thou? And this they said, tempting him, that they might have to accuse him, but Jesus stooped down with his finger, wrote on the ground as though he had, uh, as, if, as though he heard them not. Now, actually, in Jewish custom and stuff, what he should have done was given them an answer right away when they had a question of him, but he ignored them. Does, uh, I've heard a lot of people say he was writing their names in the ground. He was writing the sin they were involved in in the ground. Uh, but studying this out, and the, the most things that I found is he was just flat out ignoring them. They came to find out that he was ignoring them, so they continued asking him. Um, he lifted up himself, and he said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him cast a stone at her. He that was without sin, let him cast first cast a stone at her. Now, can we apply that to our everyday lives? Can, can we really apply that to our everyday lives? He's without sin among you. Uh, let him first cast a stone at her. Uh, and again, he stooped down and, and wrote on the ground. So he went on back ignoring them again. And they which heard it being convicted by their own conscience. See, we put that in there. Being convicted by their own conscience. They knew that they had sin in their lives. Uh, they went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last, and Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. 
When Jesus had lifted up himself, and he saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? And she said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Now this does not mean that she will not be condemned to hell one day if she never finds Jesus Christ as her Savior. Jesus saying, My hour is not come yet. Uh, you can look up some 20, 30 times that Jesus said that it says that about Jesus throughout the uh, Gospels, that his hour had not come yet, uh, the, the hour for the Son of Man had not come yet, or it wasn't his time yet as far as being crucified, being died, buried, resurrected and, and into heaven. It wasn't his time yet to judge people. He said, neither, that's why he said, neither do I condemn to go and sin no more. Now, there may be a day that she might stand at the great white throne of judgment, or she might sit at the uh, believer's seat in front of Jesus. Uh, we don't know how she lived her life from there. But Jesus said, neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin uh, no more. That takes us to number one. We find a lot of times that within a church, when we're talking about this same scenario, that we have a lot of uh, church members, a lot of Christians, a lot of so-called Christians, uh, either way, whether they're truly saved or not, uh, that like to be stone broke. Drop the stone. You live your life without sin, drop the stone. And they go around and they, they publicly announce other Christian brother or sister sin. Or they go around to those brothers and sisters and, and they, they say, psh, 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 psh. you know, that kind of stuff. How'd they do it on everybody that was running? Yeah, 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 yeah. Something like that or however it was. Uh, but they like to go around and, and tell people uh, about the sin that they are in. And that is not their position to do so. Yeah, right. In Hebrews, it says that the pastor has to give an account. It's up to the pastor to give that account. It's up to that pastor to talk to that person and um, it's not by an individual church member. Uh, number two there, uh, pastor's wife destroys family because of her thinking that she can reach out and say whatever she wants to, wherever she is, and that because she's the pastor's wife, that it's just as golden as if the pastor or the good Lord Jesus Christ said it himself. We have a friend that's been about 20 years ago. Uh, his son and daughter-in-law were in a bad car wreck, and his grandbaby. The son and daughter-in-law and the grandbaby all died in a car wreck. The pastor and the pastor's wife get to the hospital and the doctors and nurses are around and other families uh, of the rest, rest of the family members, brothers and sisters uh, of the one that had passed away were all there at the hospital and the pastor's wife looks at the mom who just lost her son and daughter-in-law and grandbaby and said, if you were living your life right for God, supposedly being a Christian, this would not have happened. This is your fault. Oh, she has not been in church for the last 25, 20, 22, 25 years since that happened. Right there in front of the rest of the family, doctors and nurses and everything else. And then trying to come and visit them at their home the, the following day and saying about the same thing. And, and uh, the husband, the, the dad who lost the son and Daughter law and grandbaby, it's time for you to go. You don't get out, I will take you. He is not a deacon in his church at this time because his wife will not attend church. He's one of the most knowledgeable men I have ever met in my life in the Gospels. Not just the Gospel, the Bible on the whole. His wife's a saintly woman. 
She was hurt so bad by that. She has never been back in church since. Then. Because somebody thinking they have the right to, to say um, whatever they want to happen to say. We got to show love, compassion for people. You know, that's, that that saying that I know, like Debbie and Rita had heard it, and Charles and, and the Auxiliers heard it from being down south. Anybody's from down south to get further with uh, um, what is it, honey and and, and that that you do with vinegar. You know, there's a little more to that saying, but. Uh, it's true. You gotta have love and compassion for people. Where is our love and compassion when we're going and telling somebody that's a church member how wrong they are in the way that they're living their lives if we're not living that life with them? If we don't, or if we're not in their home with them, we don't know what's going on with them. It's not ours <coughs> to say that to them. God's the one that'll convict. And I can see people that are so, so uh, I, I, have, I put some more notes on here that I didn't write down on here. Uh, the disease of I know it all, busybodies and gossipers. The disease of I know it all, busybody and gossipers. People want to take the responsibility to go and call somebody out on their sin. It's not theirs to do. But there's a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof is always death. Death is, is, is eternal separation from God. Death is separation one from another. You can look at it that way too. Why should we have a broken spirit between two Christians? Amen. Amen. So while I'm on that soapbox, let's go with it, okay? I'm that way as far as the legalistic churches. We have in our Bible prophecy saying in the last days there shall become a great falling away and I'm stupid enough if you want to call me that to say that's not due to Satan. That's due to Christians. And legalism in church is going around and you got to have your hair this length. You can't wear makeup if you're a woman. You have to wear a dress. You have to have pointed square to pointer or square toed shoes on. You have to have this on. You have to have that on. You have to act like this. You got to put up with more church dog and junk than what you do the Gospels. Amen. And what you do the Word of God. And it's time that we get back to the Word of God instead of the ways of man. Amen. If we're going to have a falling away from the church. Let's make it a real falling away from the church and not a separation because so and so wanted to run their mouth and hurt somebody so bad that they've not been back to church. Every time we go to call somebody out, we take that risk. Amen. You know, and I just come up with a, a couple of examples, not picking on anybody or anything else, but Brother Harold sees Brother Charles is, is this way, and Brother Charles wants or Brother Harold wants to go over to Brother Charles and say, Hey, you're living your life like this, you can't be doing that, and he wants to run it down and call him out on and everything else. No. Brother Harold should be coming to the pastor. And a pastor would go to Brother Charles. Brother Harold never knows if the pastor went or not. And he'll never know the conversation because that's between that pastor and Brother Charles. Period. And it's between, after that, it becomes between Brother Charles and God. Period. It's not our duty to try to make somebody repent. Uh, right there, the next highlighted part I have is we cannot force anyone to repent. We cannot force anyone to repent. They must come on their own. They must make that decision on their own. Repentance is personal and private and should be treated that way. It's personal and private and should be treated that way. So knowing <laughs> someone else's sin or mistakes, we need to love and support and comfort them. 
Then they may be led to repentance by our love for them, not by our calling them out, so to speak. We cannot decide for them when it is time for them to repent. We cannot decide that for somebody else. I like the way Jesus talked about that, but let me put it in uh, in uh, good old drawer terms. How can you take the toothpick out of somebody else's eyes when you got a telephone pole in yours? You have sin in your life, and yet you're expecting to go up there and, and take something little and tiny out of somebody else's, and you can't even see the sin that's in your life. <coughs> Or you refuse to. Which is it? You can't see it or, or you refuse to. Uh, we cannot decide for them when it is time to repent. Number three, it is not our job to go about the church calling members out on their sin, provided that sin is not against the church or another member in the church. Now, there's something going down but by, by somebody that is affecting the church. It needs to be dealt with, and it needs to be dealt with swiftly. We are neither judge or jury over sin and repentance. It's up to that person. You see, we get so much up on our high legalistic horses that we lose sight of all the things uh, that are going on. And um, we need to just uh, love people. It's our Christian duty to love, support, counsel, and help a fellow Christian through their struggles. John 15, 12. Uh, Jesus said, this is my commandment, that ye love one another as I have loved. How many commandments are there? We have, we have ten under the law, as far as the law of Moses. How many more commandments are there as far as in the Levitical law, the Levitical priesthood? Uh, we can't keep track of all of that. Uh, what commandment did Jesus give? That we love one another. Is it loving one another to try to tear one another down? Is it loving one another trying to call somebody out on what they do, on what their sins are, and we're not even looking uh, at, at, at our own sin? We're not even looking at where we've been. It is not a, a, a brother or sister's duty in God, in Christ, to call somebody else out. Uh, Jesus said, no man come to the Father but by me. That's the only way. And I, I like what the great evangelist said, uh, Dr. Terry Van Buskirk, we affectionately call him Doc Van, a uh, wonderful man, we've had him in our home, and he said about uh, one Christian talking and, and looking down on another Christian, you don't say, oh, a fine mess you've gotten yourself into down there in the gutter. See what your sin has done to you? I told you! <laughs> the only time that a Christian should be looking down on another Christian is when they're lifting, when they're putting that head down here and saying, can I help you out? Amen. Can I help you out? I like how uh, uh, a good friend of mine, uh, if the, the uh, street evangelist and, and uh, um, good Christian man, Tim Law, that I work with, put it, puts it. Uh, he puts it. Um, he talked to a guy. He says, "I tell you what, I love you too much. Just, just yeah, just leave it there. Don't get hit." Uh, I love you too much not to tell you. I love you too much not to. I love you too much to let you go. Have we ever told that to somebody? Have we, ever, have we ever taken somebody that was just so far gone in their sin or, or whatever and said, hey, you know, I, I love you so much, I'm going to pray for you. You know, we're so concerned about calling people out and telling them where, what they're doing wrong and, and where they are, where they're, where they're wrong, but did we ever hit our knees before we did that? That's a good one, isn't it? Even if I said that, that's a good one. Uh, 
we need to we need to hit our knees first. We need to be in prayer first. The right to see there's a way that seems right unto man, but the end thereof always leads to death. Now see, I could take and call Sister Carol out for her phone going off and getting all over her. Oh man. <laughs> We love you, Carol. I thought I turned it off. <laughs> but, but you know, it could just be something as simple as she forgot to turn it off and she thought she had it off, so we need to show some love. Carol, can I give you a hand and, and help you out and tell you I'm not your sister? <laughs> See, that's, that, that, the thing is, that's a perfect example. That's a, that's a perfect example, though. How many people would have would have gotten angry, or how many people would say, "Do you believe she had her phone on during this service and it interrupted everything, and I couldn't concentrate on anything anyway?" And you weren't concentrating on anything else anyway because you're looking to see what everybody else is doing anyway. That's a perfect example of what I'm talking about. We can criticize, 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 and try to call somebody out, but can we show them? That love we need to show them and do we pray for them as we need to be praying for them. As a Christian, we only seek uh, Jesus for repentance. Jesus said, No man cometh Father but by me. Uh, that's even in our prayer life after we're saved. Uh, we go to Jesus who takes it to our Father. We don't seek it just to feel better. We don't go to men to appease them. True repentance is in private and alone with God. I forgot about that, Dave. Uh, you're the only one accountable for your sin. You are the only one accountable for your sin. It may affect other people. It may have a big adverse effect on other people, but you are the only one accountable for your sin. But as I said about lifting people up, we, we lift them up. Proverbs 27, 17 says, Iron sharpeneth iron, so a man sharpeneth the countenance of his friend. Iron <laughs> sharpeneth iron, so a man sharpeneth the countenance of his friend. We need to be lifting each other up. We need to be sharpening ourselves together in the Word of God. Iron sharpeneth iron. Proverbs 27 and 17. Uh, John 3, 17 and 18. For God sent his Son not into the world to condemn the world, that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, and he that believeth is not condemned all that he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And when we have somebody that is saved and a saved Christian, they're not condemned. God didn't send his Son into the world to condemn the world. Why should we as Christians think that we can condemn another Christian for uh, things that they might be doing or, or whatever that doesn't measure up to us? To our own standard. All the way back. And I'll get to it. I have the most nimble fingers in the world, so I can flip right through these. The disease of I know it all. The gossipers. The gossipers. The backbiters. Well, I know it all. I've been in the church for 97 years. My great-great-great-grandpa was a preacher. My my great-great-grandpa was a preacher. Did I start with three greats? Uh, my my great-great and my great-grandpa were preachers. And my dad was. And, and my niece, my nephew, my aunts, and my uncles, they were all preachers and deacons and, and everything else. So I know it all. I, I can make whatever judgment. No, no, you can't. It's up to God. Why do we have an I know it all or a God complex about it when we're saved? 
We can't have that. It's, it's lifting up with love. Amen, Brian? Lifting up with love. Amen, Sister Carol? Amen. I think she might still be trying to phone up. <laughs> <laughs> I love her anyway. But uh, we need to be lifting up with love. We need to be lifter uppers. And I say that about the cross of Jesus Christ. If I be lifted up, I'll draw all men unto me. And we need to be those lifter uppers. Jesus said we'll do things that, that were greater than the things that he did because of his Holy Spirit living inside of us once he ascended to the Father. And we need to be lifter uppers. We need to give gospel out and lift Christ up to them. And then when they are down and in the doldrums and everything else and stuff that we could really just rail at them and accuse them of and everything else, what good is that going to do? We need to lift them up with love. I remember I was shocked one day because I had done some stuff that I ought not have done. And, well, usually when, whenever I did stuff that I ought not to have done and, and I deserved a good whooping and, and all that kind of stuff, um, Dad would come home and we'd get that good whooping. Dad wasn't a talker. He was a whooper. Dad wasn't a talker. He was the one that got a switch or got a belt. It was too cold to walk across the street to get a switch and cut it off the, the willow trees or the... Uh, Bushes that was across the street, he got his belt. That didn't feel good. I already knew that I was wrong. I'd already had a conversation with mom before dad ever got home, but mom being so little and tiny and knowing that she could take a, a ball bat and beat us with it, and we'd just laugh, <laughs> would wait till dad got home. We need to be lift her uppers. We already knew we did wrong. What do we need a beating for? And dad come home, he'd take that belt or that switch, and, and we would end up crying a bit. One day, dad got home, and I'm waiting for him. I'm ready. And he just looked at me and said, Michael, you already know what you've done wrong. I said, yeah. Yeah, I was proud. Yeah. Rebellious and all that. He said, it's not going to be do any good for me to tear you down even more. Thinking, who are you and what have you done with my dad? <laughs> and he talked to me about it for the first time ever. And he said, We have an agreement. You see, you don't have to be a, a, a murderer, an adulterer, as this woman here in our text today, or a thief, or anything else, be condemned by Jesus. God sent his son, his son not into the world to condemn the world, but the world through him might be saved. He that believes on him is not condemned, but he that believes not is condemned already. We have that nature inside of us of sin. And we're condemned to the devil's hell. So what good would it have done for Jesus to come with that sin nature being inside of people and start pointing out their sins and tell them they're going to hell? <coughs> he simply told the woman, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. It's kind of those words my dad had used at that time. We have an agreement. Yeah. My backside said, oh yeah. You know, we, we had that agreement. It's kind of like the day I came to know Jesus Christ as my Savior. And y'all have uh, heard my testimony. And I knew I wouldn't wake up that morning. And I'm not giving my life over. He said, my was burned for a sin of death. Or a death of sin. And, and he said, 
I don't come as you might have life, you might have more fun than later. He said, I'm coming to forgive you. Do you want that? And I said, Yeah. Have you made that decision and said, Yeah, I want that? Yeah, I, I want that. You've never made that decision. We're going to be playing a song here of invitation. Jesus Messiah. Is that what we're playing for invitation? Or? Yes. Yes, Jesus Messiah. Yes. And, and uh, Chris Tomlin. So everybody can stand and, and sing. And uh, everybody go ahead and stand. We're going to have a prayer real quick before uh, the song starts playing. Let's pray. Lord, we we're, we're come to you at this time, this call, call, this invitation time, God. God, we're saying that, you know, no matter what we've done, we can't go and, and just start uh, uh, running our mouths about others and, and all that. And God, where we have done that, please forgive us, Lord. Lord, where other Christians have been uh, down and, and cast out and, and, and feeling unworthy and, uh, of the church or of other Christians because of one or two talking to them. Lord God, uh, re let us restore that uh, that fellowship and that joy with them. Let them know that, that we love them, Lord. And Lord, if anybody is here today and they don't know Jesus Christ, their Savior, God, Jesus said when he came to this earth, neither do I condemn thee, go and sin no more. God, I, I pray that they will uh, come knowing that they're, they're condemned already because they have not yet believed in the name of the Son of God, the only begotten name uh, of the Son of God. That God, that they'll come and find a, a new life in you. And these things we ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. We're going to play this song, Jesus Messiah. If you know it, sing it out. What a great song. And we might become His righteousness He humbled Himself Thank you. 